Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Stephanie Bond. I'm Tricia, and for the, po the past four and a half years, I've moved around Amazon's books teams, learning the business so I can share it with authors. All right, but enough about me. We're here to talk about Stephanie. Stephanie Bond was several years into a corporate uh, computer programming career when an instructor in her evening MBA program remarked that she had a flair for writing and encouraged her to submit a project to academic journals. But she instantly thought, I wonder if I could write a romance. She spent every spare moment the next couple of years writing and submitting manuscripts before selling her romantic comedy, Irresistible, to Harlequin Enterprises. After selling 10 projects, Stephanie walked away from her corporate career to write commercial fiction full-time. To date, she's published over 100 romance and mystery projects with Harlequin, Random House, St. Martin's Press, Harper Collins, and more recently, under her own imprint. Stephanie's independently published romantic comedy, Stop the Wedding, a Kindle bestseller is now a Hallmark Channel movie. And in January 2018, CBS Studios optioned Stephanie's independently published Coma Girl serial. This is an Amazon exclusive for TV series development. Welcome, Stephanie. Hello. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, and thanks to everyone listening. I see if there's a good crowd out there. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's get started by talking a little bit about why you decided that being an author was your calling. We heard a little bit in your intro, but I want to hear more about it from you. Oh, so uh, so I, I grew up, like most writers, I was an avid reader, so I grew up reading probably a book a day throughout my teenage years, but I didn't think about writing at all until I was well into my corporate career and someone else brought to my attention that I had a flair for writing. Now, in, in hindsight, I'm a little embarrassed that somebody else had to tell me uh, something that uh, maybe I should have known about myself, but I think most people listening will, will have those moments like, yeah, it felt it was so inherent to us that we write, that we want to write, that uh, it didn't seem like anything special. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. somebody else brought it to my attention. And as soon as they did, it's like everything fell into place for me that, yeah, this is what I want to do. So I loved okay. my corporate job, but very quickly uh -huh. I transitioned into writing. So very quickly, about how long did that transition uh, take? Well, so this was back in the late 80s. So I spent a couple of years uh, submitting manuscripts, many, many manuscripts getting rejected, submitting, getting rejected. It took about two years of submitting uh, and writing before I sold my first manuscript. Now, how many books did you have over that two year? Was it just reworking the same book over and over again, or was it writing multiple books? No, writing multiple uh, manuscripts. So I, I probably wrote six manuscripts that I would submit and get feedback on and submit again and uh, just going through that uh, submission cycle that was really the only vehicle that we had, uh, you know, back in the late 80s was traditional publishing. Right, right. Now, what genre do you pr primarily write in? We heard that romance, is that your, your mm -hmm. comfort zone? Yeah, so I love writing romantic comedy and I write, uh, humorous romantic mysteries that are kind of a blend of the genres, uh, which uh, we can talk about a little bit more later if, if anyone's interested. But um, actually, I think that was one of the reasons why I was less successful in traditional publishing, um, because I wrote a blended genre that needed to be shelved in one particular area of the book of the bookstore. And, you know, they would put me in romance and uh, it wasn't enough romance for my romance readers or the, they put me in mystery and it wasn't enough mystery for the mystery readers. And so I kind of fell through the cracks, you know, when it came to being shelved in a bookstore. And that's mm -hmm. not the case in self-publishing and being able to sell uh, through the Kindle. Of course, you know, there's shelf space for everyone. 
and readers can find me, um, you know, in that blended genre. So that's just been a, a boon going into self-publishing. So you're you're both traditionally published and you're in self-publishing. How long mm -hmm. ago did you make that transition into self-publishing? So I was traditionally published um, from the late 80s through the 90s, uh, through um, about 2011, I think is when I um, started reconsidering my relationship with traditional publishing. So at that time, the uh, recession was catching up to the book industry. Mm -hmm. and um, Honestly, publishers just weren't passing out a lot of uh, contracts. Um, I went to a readers conference in Los Angeles and I heard that there was a group of writers and they were mostly on the West Coast uh, that were having some success publishing through KDP and doing really well. And I had accumulated about a dozen titles that I'd gotten my rights back to because back then books could still be out of print. So I'd gotten some rights back and uh, those were just sitting there. I hadn't done anything with them. Not sure what I would do with them. Just thinking that I knew they were better off in my hands than with anyone else. So those were sitting there and I heard about KDP and I thought, well, you know, what do I have to lose? So I put these books up and that was my first foray into self-publishing. And that was late 2011 and it changed the trajectory of my life. How so? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's mm -hmm. I, I've heard that before, so I'm really interested to see how that changed your trajectory. Well, so um, everything that I didn't like about traditional publishing uh, was everything that I loved about self-publishing. So I was able to set my own deadlines. I could write about anything I wanted to. I could set my own pricing. I could develop my own packaging and publish whenever I wanted. And the best part of that though, was I could then keep the lion's share of my profits. So um, instantly I was hooked on self-publishing and it, uh, you know, I'm not gonna discount my, um, my background in traditional publishing. I'm sure that gave me a little bit of a readership to springboard from, um, but um, I was in a position to immediately uh, notice the advantages of self-publishing Whereas people who had never been in traditional publishing maybe didn't understand what a, what a leap this was forward for authors. Mm -hmm. So to that point, when you made the move over to, to self-publishing, did you have a team already built that you relied on for, say, editing and mm -hmm. um, marketing or cover design or formatting or is that something you took on yourself did you did you take on the all of that um all that prep that needs to happen with um indie publishing yeah so uh so in the beginning um i so i went with a, a, a cover artist because i knew my limitations there like i had ideas for the packaging i wanted but um i knew i couldn't execute on those so i uh wanted this best things, one of the best decisions I made was to get a graphic artist to do my covers. Um, so that was part of my team that I built then. Then uh, for editing, the first few books I put out were books that I've been reverted from traditional publishing. So those were already edited. So I didn't have mm -hmm. to worry about that for those first few projects. Although those books were also old enough that I felt like I needed to go back and update them before I put them out. So technology had changed, had changed. Um, there were cultural references that had changed. So there were some tweaks that I had to make to those manuscripts before I put them back out. As I moved forward in my career, um, I think the biggest um, skill that I was able to, uh, to learn and uh, I think is the most valuable thing that I learned how to do is how to format my own books. Now that's not necessary mm -hmm. now because uh, you can do that through uh, Kindle now. You can format your own book through Kindle. But at the time, mm -hmm. you had to pay a formatter to format your book to put out. And I learned how to do that and I learned a lot in the process of learning how to format my own books. As far as editing goes, in the beginning, I did use uh, an editor and proofreaders and now I just use a proofreader. Oh, okay. You've got that kind of formula down then, huh? Well, um, and I've written enough books that I feel like, you know, I don't uh, get as much out of an editor as I did earlier in my career. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm just more in tune to what my uh, readers are looking for. And there are certain things that, um, like I can think back on books that I wrote for traditional publishing and editors changed them in ways that I think they might have been, you know, a little would have been stronger if they had if they hadn't changed them. So okay. I, uh, it's not necessarily bad though, because I got a better sense of what things I wanted in my books and things I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. So I just became really good at self-editing. And so now I'm at a point where I've written enough that I hopefully can catch those plot mistakes and character mistakes mm -hmm. before I commit them to paper. So that's, that's why I don't use an editor as much as I used to. Okay. So what is one thing that you wish people understood about self-publishing? Oh, um, okay. So this is a, a good audience because uh, most people here do realize self-publishing is just, it just means flexibility. It just means independence. Um, all of the things I mentioned before. Um, but one thing that I think even self-published authors don't do, uh, um, even veteran self-published authors don't do as much as, as we should, or, uh, uh, they should, I should say, I, I, maybe I don't even do this as much as I should, is to experiment more. Um, realize that if you've got a book that isn't performing as well as you'd hoped, that you can, you know, go back and change the, uh, the, the cover. Uh, you can change the metadata. You can change um, even the content of the book. Um, look at your reviews and see if there are things that readers maybe want more of or objected to. If their feedback feels organic to you, you can always uh, either just tweak the book, put up another version, uh, or take it down, rewrite it, put it up again. Different cover, different price point, uh, different back cover copy, uh, the, your product description, even your metadata you can change. I mean, there are just so many things about the book that you control. And people, I think, uh, tend to publish the book and then forget about it, especially mm -hmm. if um, they have a lot of books out there and I'm getting to the point too where it's harder and harder to manage my backlist because I'm producing new books all the time and so I have to remind myself you know look at all my books see if there are some uh, books out there that aren't performing as well as they should be and maybe what I need to do to resurrect those books so to me that's the one part of self-publishing that I feel like most authors aren't making the most of. That's a really good call out. Um, kind of branching off that, you have a very strong um, aesthetic or uh, brand when it comes to your covers. Uh, very yeah. easy to look at your covers and know that this is a Stephanie Bond. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think to your point, that's something else that I don't know that um, self-published authors do as well as they can. Yeah, so um, because I was in traditional publishing, there were just so many things about you know, different books that were released and packaging that I, you know, was not 100% happy with. And those, a lot of those things were out of my hands. Um, again, though, it was such a learning experience because through that process, I learned things that I wanted to do if I had control. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I kind of believe in, um, you see from the poster behind me, that my name treatment, um, that this is a nonfiction book, but I have the same name, tr name treatment on all my uh, fiction on my novels as well. Um, I personally believe that um, my name should take up more real estate on the cover than anything else on the cover. Um, mm -hmm. I just I think for personal branding, you know, why not let readers know, you know, this is a Stephanie Bond book or this is a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a Mary Jacobs book, whatever your name is, you know, let readers know this is your book. And I think in traditional publishing, there's so much of uh, is given way to the uh, the the images on the cover, uh, maybe even the title, all of those things. Um, to me, all of those things should be secondary to the author's name. Um, so that's how I I present all my books. The other thing that I do with my covers is I keep them very simple. So I don't use people on my covers. I use images. You know, part of that is mm -hmm. because I um, don't particularly want um, my uh, to have people on the cover where the readers get an idea of what the race of those characters are. I want readers mm -hmm. to, you know, read their own uh, experiences into my characters. Uh, but the other thing is, I feel like I'm 
I'm looking for images that are more of the tone of the book. So, for mm -hmm. example, I released a romantic comedy earlier this year um, called It Takes a Rebel. I'm mm -hmm. telling you the title only because it evokes, you know, a, uh, a certain image in people's mind. Right. And instead of putting, though, a hunky guy on the cover, I chose to put uh, just a black leather coat on the cover. And to me, mm -hmm. just having the black leather jacket on the cover just said everything that, you know, it needed, you needed to say. You, you got that this was, uh, you know, about a, a rebel hero. You got that from the mm -hmm. title and the image, and you didn't need the picture of the hunky guy on the cover. Um, so I'm much more about simplistic covers. I think they look better in thumbnail. I think that's something that a lot mm -hmm. of authors overlook. They don't look at their covers um, in a very small, you know, in a thumbnail fashion, because that's how most readers see them. So I'm all about mm -hmm. high color, high contrast, simple simple covers did you find when you transitioned to that from the traditional publishing and you you started that branding did you find any pushback from your readers or anything mm -hmm. like that no no pushback actually i think they liked it because it made my books a little easier to find and you know that mm -hmm. was back when discoverability was was easier now that discoverability is is harder than ever to me, this is definitely a time that if, if anyone out there think their book isn't performing as well as they'd hoped, uh, maybe streamline the cover and see if it helps. You know, make your name larger, um, streamline the imaging, change the, the color so that it's, there's a high contrast um, and, uh, and see if it makes a difference. That's the great thing. You know, keep your old cover in the wings. Uh, if the new cover doesn't help, you can always go back to the old cover. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think my readers like my covers because they're, uh, it, it just makes it easier to find my books. And really, that's what readers want. They want to be able to make a mm -hmm. quick choice once they find the book right. that they want. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Um, so the book that's behind your head, uh, your personal, uh, personal fiction writing coach, 365 right. days of motivation and tips to write a great book. Let's talk right. about that for a minute, because that's really interesting. If your primary genre is romance, mm -hmm. and then here you have a, a how-to book, if you don't, oh. right? Right. So can you talk right. a little yeah, this, about that? Yeah, this is my own full, my only full-length uh, nonfiction book that I have. Um, it's actually based on a blog that I used to have a couple of websites ago. So I had mm -hmm. um, a writing blog. I don't know, maybe five or six years or so, and just lots of tips out there. And I, I had a lot of friends that would ask, um, you know, why don't you write a book? Why don't you put all this in one place? And uh, I just resisted, resisted. And uh, finally, a few, uh, I guess it's been maybe 2015, 16, I put this book out. And so this is a compilation of all of those tips from my old, old blog and a lot of things I've added and updated since. But basically it's not a book that I, um, I, that I would think somebody would sit down and absorb in one sitting. It's more of an idea of um, a, a tip every day for a year to just keep your motivation up and just to uh, learn a new tip. But it also, if someone does want to sit down and read it in one sitting, it, it guides you through, sort of eases you into the process of writing a book, um, you know, thinking about the, you know, why you want to do this, getting into the right frame of mind for writing, and then also um, things to consider before you write the first word. Uh, it also helps you coming up with the title. It's ideas for characters and how you, you know, solidify those, those uh, elements before you start writing. But then it's also about plotting. It gets into um, the, the writing life. Uh, it also talks about, you know, how to end your book. I mean, it literally takes you from beginning to the end, the process of, of writing a book. So mentioning kind of how to keep motivated, I know we got a lot of questions around mm -hmm. that. Um, people are interested in how you stay motivated and then what your daily, you know, mm -hmm. what your daily life looks like, right? Can you share a little yes. bit about that? Sure. So yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. So trust me, I know that all of you out there, you know, your, your motivation will give out before your imagination does. Um, it's, you know, it's uh, a, it's a solitary, uh, vocation, no more so than now when we're all shut in. Uh, but it's always it's a it's a solitary vocation, so you're already spending a lot of time alone. 
And uh, so you have to be that self-starter. And some people are and some people aren't. And that doesn't mean you can't finish your book. Either way, you can finish your book. But sometimes you just have to plant more things into your day to keep you motivated. So there are just some things that I do routinely. I've just learned over years and years that I try every night before I uh, start winding down, I write a list of things I'd like to get done the next day. It's important that when I get up in the morning that I'm not walking around in a sense of float, like I have too much to do and I don't know what to do first. Um, uh, so I always have a plan of where I'm going for the day and you know try to be flexible, but I also know like what I need to get done, not necessarily that day, but look at the week ahead. So what do I need to get done this week? So I need to get this much writing done. I need to balance my books. I need to pay taxes. I need to do a webinar. I need to, uh, um, just, you know, lots of different administrative things and marketing things. It's all uh, integral to the business nowadays. And I mm -hmm. just don't think you can compartmentalize as much as what would be nice to sometimes. I will say that I've gotten very accustomed to writing in small spurts. So I can write in 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It's important to me not only that I um, um, take advantage of those little short um periods of time, but that I also know like where I'm going in my writing project. So I've always got my project outlined, um, ready. And I never sit down and look at a blank screen. I think that's like, you know, death to uh, a schedule. It's just not knowing where you're going. So this mm -hmm. is, you know, take it from me 20 some years in, it's even you people that write from the seat of your pants, we call you pansters. Um, right. If you're a pansters, Still, it just just take a few minutes and try to think of where your story is going before you before you sit down at a blank mm -hmm. screen, and that will make all the difference. And uh, I call them little wins. To me, if you can get little wins throughout the day, that will keep you motivated. Yeah, absolutely. You know that checklist where you just cross through. Yeah. I still have a handwritten yeah. list that I cross through, um, yeah. just so I can see. Oh, I've accomplished at least one thing. My yeah. goal is to yeah. at least cross off one thing a day. Yeah, I agree. All right. Now, you are, you've hit the USA Today and New York Times bestseller list? So I haven't hit the oh. Times list um, because, okay. um, well, uh, we can talk a little bit more about how that list is put together. But uh, okay. I have hit the USA Today list, and I, I just want to point mm -hmm. out that it's something that all of my publishers tried to do and couldn't. Um, so I've written for a lot of the big publishers in New York and at different times they all said, oh, this is the one that's gonna hit the list. And I would wait right. and it didn't. Um, and so I didn't hit the USA Today list until I started self-publishing. I put myself on the USA Today list. Um, that's now when amazing. It comes, I, I know that was a good feeling. Uh, so when it comes to the Times list, that's more of a, that's not straight sales. It's more of a, I won't mm -hmm. say curated, but a weighted list. And to get right. on the times you have to have, um, you have to have sales sources of a certain amounts mm -hmm. from different, different uh, retailers. And so mm -hmm. the books that I've sold that of mine that have sold the most and the best were books that were exclusive to Amazon. And so then they weren't eligible for bestseller lists. That's okay. interesting. And it, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Right. So it's a good way to weigh it, you know, when people are like, okay, uh, am I successful because I've hit the New York Times bestseller list or am I successful because I've reached this amount of sales? And I think that it's, it's each author has their own priority. Exactly. It depends where you are in your career. I understand that some people do want the, you know, list making status, you know, will give them a boost at certain points. Um, but to me, having a number one bestseller status in a particular category on Amazon, mm -hmm. that that's good for me. Good. good. All right. So we have a lot of aspiring authors. What Yay. advice would you give? Yeah. What advice would you give a brand new aspiring author who's either considering or new to KDP? Mm. Uh, so I would say, um, First of all, if you haven't put your book out, you've got to you've got to get your book finished. Of course, you know, just stop dragging mm -hmm. your heels. I will say this: 
I know a lot of people will get almost to the end of their book and then it starts to feel scary and they mm -hmm. just don't finish or they'll start mm -hmm. a new project. But um, don't do that to yourself. Know that that's just procrastination. So if you haven't finished the book, finish it and get it up there. I mean, just getting over that hump will be such a uh, relief and you'll realize that it's just not as scary as it sounds. And it's it's part of the process. I mean, it's mm -hmm. part of the deal that we make things that are put up in public and the public gets to respond to them. That's the two way street. That's the agreement that a writer, mm -hmm. that a creative person has with their audience. I put it out there and you get to react to it. So the sooner you pull the trigger on publishing, the better. Let's talk about that that reaction because I think that that's something that a, a lot of new authors um, they're one afraid of and then two they're a little um, fixated on and that's those reviews those customer mm -hmm. reviews at the bottom of Amazon people get very focused on that can you share a little bit about your experience and how you use those if you read them I think so I don't obsess over reviews. I do read them occasionally, um, especially if I've got a new release. What I, I don't want to see, for example, if somebody has noticed a, a problem with formatting or something like that, right. those are the kinds of things that I want to know about as soon as possible. If there's mm -hmm. an issue uh, on a particular, um, for a particular device or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I do skim reviews for that reason. Um, I think it's just a matter of experience. You know, the, you'll talk to a writer, the further they are into their career, you will realize and, and see that they just don't put as much stock uh, in good or bad reviews. I mean, we all want them because we know good reviews mm -hmm. will help push our books higher in the rank and then more people discover us. And that's why I always ask for reviews and I'm always thrilled to see good reviews. Um, but if there's a, you know, a clunker review in there, you know, I just think, oh, well, that person, you know, I pushed a button for them uh, or mm -hmm. they were having a bad day. Uh, I mean, think about mm -hmm. yourself as a reader and how many times you've read something that maybe just didn't sit right with you. And if you'd read it on a different day, it wouldn't have had the same impact. Um, right. You know, also think about like watching a TV show. Uh, there, there might be an episode that you see that wasn't your favorite, like maybe you didn't even like it at all, but does that make you not want to ever watch that TV show again? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, so just right. realize that readers, um, there's a, a, a outliers out there that will say, oh, I'll never mm -hmm. read anything from this author again, but those people are really few and far between. And even people that mm -hmm. read something and they'll say, well, that wasn't my favorite Stephanie Bond book. Um, you know, that's fine, um, They, but they'll probably read my next book. So the mm -hmm. bottom line is keep writing, keep putting more books out there. And honestly, the more books you put out there, it sort of dilutes the impact that you feel for any one release. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent point. I think the other thing is just keeping in mind that sometimes, you know, your, re your reader base is it's your, uh, I'm sorry, let me refocus what I'm trying to say. Your books are not gonna be for everyone, right? And uh, so occasionally somebody's gonna read your right. book that it just wasn't their cup of tea. That's right. Actually, early on in my career, I had a, a more veteran writer friend uh, when I was telling her about some bad reviews I had gotten on a, a traditionally published book. This has been you know, way back. She said, oh, right. well, congratulations. That means that you have expanded your readership outside of this you know little core group of fans that you know were, were following you and she said you you really should um, look at those uh, sort of neutral and the and the negative reviews as you have widened your reach and that's a very good thing mm -hmm. good call out do you mm -hmm. ever use, um, when you were first moving into indie publishing, did you ever use the reviews to check to see if your metadata was correct? Like, can I adjust the description or should I adjust the categories I'm in or anything like that? Yeah, especially if you see something like, well, this wasn't the book that I expected it to be. That Those are the words you want to look for just to know that your metadata isn't quite right. Um, or mm -hmm. if they say, um, you know, well, from the cover, I thought this would be a such and such book, uh, but it's not that at all. You know, those are the kinds of things that I look for. 
Um, and I remember there was one book I released in traditional publishing that um, the covers, the cover was just, uh, just universally panned. It was um, such a okay. kind of a dark serial killer, you know, slasher kind of uh, cover. And my story wasn't that at all. And I was mm -hmm. just, just uh, you know, it was it was really upsetting then because there wasn't anything I could do about the cover after it had already been released. But now mm -hmm. those are things that you can read reviews, and if you see that the reaction is different, that um, it's not the book they expected, and you realize something's wrong either with your cover, maybe with the uh, metadata, uh, or even with your product description. You know something's off, mm -hmm. and it allows you to go back mm -hmm. and adjust that. So I suggest people read the reviews, but read them for what kind of what you, how useful they can be to you. Mm -hmm. So I know that everybody's very into, we got tons and tons of questions around marketing and that's everybody mm -hmm. wants to know, how do I get people to notice my book? What marketing tactic has been most successful for you in reaching mm -hmm. and engaging new readers? So a couple of things. So um, I hope that everyone out there is already working on developing an email list. If you're not, you can start today. Uh, there's just no better tool for reaching your readers than engaging them and getting uh, their email address so that you can start uh, sending them newsletters and notices of things. Even if you haven't finished your book yet, you're still writing your book, you can still put out, let's say, snippets of the book to a potential readership to say, hey, this is what I wrote today. What do you think about it? You can engage readers in the process of writing the book. Uh, before it's even published. It's a good way to, to get people, you know, sort of in your team. Um, I think uh, there's a great book out there that says, uh, oh, uh, this last name is Kelly, who wrote the book, but he talks about the um, uh, 1,000 true fans. And if you can mm -hmm. get your email list up to 1,000 people on your email list, then that's enough to build a, a following and to be able to make a living on your writing. So start developing your email list. I will say the other two things that people overlook, if you've already, or if you're getting ready to publish your book, or if you've already published your book, you might want to look at this. Your front matter really um, is important and the back matter is really important. So I push most things in my front matter to the back. So things that you might see up front, like the copyright page, put that on the back. You know, readers don't need to wade through that. Get them into the story as quickly as possible. And then on the back end, you know, write a note and say, thank you for reading my book. Uh, this is a little bit about the genesis of the book and why I wrote it. I would really appreciate it if you uh, left a review and um, tell, tell the reader how the reviews help you. That helps you find other mm -hmm. readers. You know, sometimes readers don't think their reviews matter, um, but they mm -hmm. do especially if it's an older book, tell them that no matter when you're reading this, it's important that you leave a review. Um, and the other thing is ask them to uh, recommend your book to other fr to friends. And again, if you've got a, an email list and you send out a newsletter, say, please forward this to three friends, three reader friends you think might be interested in my book. So those two things, email list, front matter, back matter. Okay, let's go back to the email list. I think one of the, the questions we get from new authors is how do I build that? So they'll ask about going out and purchasing a, an email list or... No, 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 don't, talk don't, about that a little bit. don't buy any email uh, addresses. That sounds tempting, but no, what you want to do is build those 1,000 true fans. Those are people who are really interested in what you're doing. So, uh, like I said before, you can engage readers before you finish the book. You know, you might put up a couple of covers and say, which cover do you like? You know, which one seems to fit the book, which uh, fits the book uh, better? Or which one would you more likely respond to? Um, this is the back cover blurb I'm going to use. Would it make you buy the book? Um, mm -hmm. uh, get their, their input on um, character uh, character flaws or character traits that you might want to use. You might want to ask people, um, I'm going to set this in a particular city. Can anyone help me with the setting? Um, uh, or uh, for example, if you're reading, if you're writing about a character who's different than you are, let's say they're a different age than you are. You might say, could anyone read over this dialogue and tell me, does this sound like what a 15 year old would say? You know, there are lots of ways to engage readers um, in the process, and I would suggest that to build your list. 
And, and then again, once you start, once you get five names, ask them, you know, can you recommend, uh, can you send this to a friend of yours? Can you recommend mm -hmm. my, um, uh, can you recommend my process or my, um, um, the, the snippets that I've shared with you? Can you send those to friends of yours and ask mm -hmm. your readers to get other people um, on your list? So yeah, it's a slow process. And then it'll start to build. You'll notice after a while, after you'll have five, then you'll have 20, then you'll have 50, then you'll have 100, and it'll really start to snowball. And before you know it, you'll have those 1,000 true fans. That's a really, I think that's probably the best explanation on how to build that organically that mm -hmm. I've heard so far. So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate Aww. it. Let's go to, we also get a lot of questions around social media. Do you, do you, uh, market heavily on social media? Uh, so I don't think you can avoid being on social media. I think it's almost necessary these days. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm a pretty private person. Like I don't have a, a private Facebook account, but I have one for you know a business account for my uh, books. Um, but yes, I think it's necessary. I'm on Insta. I'm on um, Twitter, of course, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pinterest has been a big one actually for me because okay. um, especially with getting the word out about the nonfiction book on writing, um, I share a lot of information um, on Pinterest. So uh, for me, my demographic skews a little older, my reading demographic. So I would say that Facebook is still stronger for me and Pinterest is second. I've toyed with doing some things for TikTok, but I'm almost I'm kind of waiting to see if it's actually going to be taken down. You know, some right. governments are taking down TikTok, so we'll see what the U.S. government decides to do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a given. You almost have to do it, uh, but I don't use it. Um, I don't rely on it 100%. I do a few Facebook ads occasionally, but not a lot. Um, I think mostly it's just a better place to, it's a good place to engage with your readers. So not so much advertising as it is getting their feedback, all of these things that I was just talking about as far as asking them, which cover do you like? Um, I need a title for my next book. Can you help me out with things like that? Um, it's just a good place to engage with people. So not necessarily to sell, but to engage. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about um, paid advertising. Let's talk about that. Do you, do you use a lot of paid advertising? Um, you said a few I mean, Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a few Facebook ads and some um, AMS ads, those are Amazon marketing services ads. Uh, so it's the ads that you would see if you look up a book on Amazon and you'll see maybe some other ads um, either on the same page or down below mm -hmm. the image or, you know, wherever you'll see. And it'll say sponsored. So, you know, it's an ad, you know, they're not trying to trick right. you. Um, and so I do some of that, but I just don't spend a lot of money on it. Um, I, if I have a new release or if I have a book that, for example, I, I have some serials that I write and they're six part serials. So I might spend money advertising the very first part of that serial to lead readers into the rest of it. Um, and in that case, I might put a little more money behind it, but don't get caught up in thinking you have to spend a lot of money. You'll read, um, anecdotal accounts of people who spend $10,000 a month or more than 20,000 a month in ads. I just don't believe that you have to do that. I might spend $5 a day on a particular title that I'm trying to push. So it's just mm -hmm. not, and it's something in my arsenal, but it's not something that I spend a lot of money on and it's not something that I focus on. I think when it comes to marketing, you have to think in terms of lots of different tactics that kind of piggyback on each other until it becomes a cumulative effect. So let's talk about that. When you have a new launch, how do you market that? Can you kind of take us step by step in your process? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it might differ depending on the type of book it is, uh, but my standard uh, launch, uh, fa you know, my, my uh, I guess I have a countdown is what I call it. So I have a checklist and I will um, remind myself each time I have to get out the checklist every time. This is ne this never gets any easier. Um, and I'll have a list of what I need to do three months beforehand, two months beforehand, one month beforehand. And typically I'll put up the pre-order link uh, one month before the book is released. I like 30 days just seems to work for me. Other writers like a longer um, lead time. 
but I put mine up a month beforehand. And I might put the pre-order up at a discount just to reward those early, um, early buyers because I like to mm -hmm. reward my loyal readers. I would rather do that yeah. than put the book up at full price and then run it on sale later because I like mm -hmm. to reward the people who buy it first and early. Um, so I might do that, I might do a discounted price. But then I would, um, oh, and by the way, when you put your uh, pre-order up, uh, Amazon will send a uh, email out to people who've bought your books before. So mm -hmm. you can see how it's really imperative that if you've got one book out there, you're not gonna get those little marketing gimmies that you're gonna get once you put the second book out there. And, and as a matter of fact, if you're writing a book and it's gonna be 120,000 words, I'll suggest right now that you figure out a way to break that up into two books and put them out at the same time instead of putting out one long book. And you can see why, because you've got one book out there, the first book that people buy, then when you put the second book out there, Amazon is going to help you market that book by you know, trying to target it to people who bought your first book. Um, you can see all mm -hmm. of this is a cumulative, uh, again, the cumulative effect. Um, mm -hmm. Then as it gets closer to launch time for the book, I'll do social media campaigns to get my cover out there. Um, and then I'll do the day of my release, I'll put out uh, an email to my, uh, or I'm sorry, a newsletter to my email list and, mm -hmm. um, and just sort of, um, you know, I've got those, those, those steps set up. Um, I might do another uh, marketing campaign, maybe a week into the release, because it's nice to have those spikes of sales, but really what you want mm -hmm. to go for is that long tail. Um, so I think the important thing is once the book is out there, don't forget about it. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of people think, well, I didn't have time to do a big push before the release, so it's too late. I'm just going to go and you know, I'm just going to forget about it. So it's never too mm -hmm. late to go back and relaunch the book. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, don't uh, don't think that in none of this is set in stone, uh, but just experiment and try different things. Thank you for that. And just a, um, I just wanted to call out the the email that's sent out when you do a pre-order for a subsequent mm -hmm. pre-order. Just make sure that it's um, at least a month ahead of time. Uh, any if it if you do it two weeks ahead of time, like list the pre-order two weeks, the email won't get sent out. So just wanted to make yeah. sure people understand. Do it oh, at okay. least a month. But yeah, that's yeah, a really so great. Yet another reason to put it up a month and not sooner than that. Yeah, I uh, I think a right. month has always worked for me. Mm -hmm. Good. That's a really great call out. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let's take some questions. I know that we've gotten a lot of questions that came through. So let's see what we have. All right. So we have a question, who's on your team now? So do you have a publicist, a marketing manager, beta readers, agent, social media manager? Who, who's your yeah. team? Yeah, good question. So um, um, the most important person on my team right now is my so social media manager. I mentioned earlier that I'm not great at social media. It's not where I like to spend a lot of time. So I mm -hmm. realized early on, if I was gonna make the most of it, I needed an expert. So I do have a social media manager and he takes the most off my plate. Um, I have a virtual assistant that I rely on, um, not, not every day and not every week, but when I have uh, special projects that come up that I you know, need some uh, extra assistance with, um, I'll um, offload some of those onto her. Um, I mentioned my graphic, my uh, cover designer, my graphic artist, um, I rely on him heavily because I have you know, lots of books and lots of different formats. Um, so when I get a cover, I need, uh, I need a cover for the ebook, I need a square cover for the audio version. Um, if it's something I've gotten translated into another language, I need the cover for that language. So I rely on him a lot to do things like the covers, banners, um, uh, just different things for me. So, um, so he's on my team. Um, on the business side, I have a CPA. I do most of my own bookkeeping, but then I rely on my, my CPA to help me with the paperwork and to file taxes. Um, let's see, uh, I mentioned translators. Um, mm -hmm. If you get a book translated, you also have to have a proofreader in that language as well. So I have proofreaders. Um, Let's see, who else? Um, that's, that's probably about it. Occasionally I'll send 
a book off to a proofreader, um, you know, to get, you know, to see if they can catch some extra things. Um, that's, yeah, that's about it. But that's, that's, that's a lot of people. Um, oh, I do have an agent, but, uh, but she is an agent that I had when I was in traditional publishing. Uh, she and I work, I guess you would call it a la carte. So if I need mm -hmm. for her to step in to represent something, she will. And otherwise, I just, you know, self-publish and find um, and exercise my rights on my own. Excellent. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, audiobooks, and I know we haven't mm -hmm. talked at all about audiobooks. So do you publish in the three different formats? So ebook, paperback, and audiobook? Yes. Yes, and audio is absolutely exploding. I've been doing audio for a while, but it, now it's really coming into its own. So um, I don't recommend it for a beginning writer. I mean, you definitely want to make sure that your book is generating, that your ebook is generating a certain amount of sales uh, mm -hmm. before you would uh, go into audio because it is an investment and you might not see the return on that investment for a while. But uh, once you start seeing your sales increase, then I, uh, I really recommend audio. Uh, at least think about it. Get to know what the process is like, and um, you know, just just make sure that it's not something that you forget about as your career progresses. Because one thing that you'll want to do if you've written two, three, five, ten books and you get further in your, into your career, um, you'll want to go back and make sure that all of those books are working for you. So you'll want to get them into as many formats as possible. You know, you spend a lot of time writing that book, so it should be out there working for you in as many avenues as possible. That's a really good call out. Um, so you talked about your proofreaders. I think some people call them beta readers. Would you consider mm -hmm. it the same thing? Okay. Yes, and um, yes and no. Uh, so, so I don't really have beta readers because, and that's on me, because typically I don't finish a book in time to let anyone else read it, uh, you know, to give me feedback on it or to, to catch things. Um, what mm -hmm. I've done, I, I'm writing mostly serials now and I write them really, really mm -hmm. fast. So I'm actually leaning more on my readers. So I'll say, um, if you find a typo, let me know about it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm human, I'm writing these really quickly. You're getting them straight from my keyboard practically. Um, I try to read them and edit them before I put them out, of course. But if readers mm -hmm. find a, a typo, I will, um, you know, email them back, thank them. Sometimes I send them a little Amazon gift card for finding it for me. And then guess what they do with nice. that gift card? They go out and buy, find, buy more of my books, you know, and look for more typos. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm not saying put anything out there unfinished, you know, for it, for that, you know, just for the reason of doing this but it's just another way of engaging your readers. So there's mm -hmm. lots of times that readers have caught things that even my proofreaders didn't catch. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm really appreciative of that. And I always let them know and just say, thank you. And I'm not a robot, you know, robots, robots aren't writing my books yet. <laughs> uh, so I'm human and I'm making, I make mistakes and I really appreciate you finding them. And um, it's just another way of relating to your reader and letting them be involved in the process. So for your, your mystery writing process, kind of where do mm -hmm. the ideas come and, and how do you kind of um, plan that out? What's so so my mysteries are all um, humorous, at least I hope they are. They're supposed to be. Um, so I, I tend to say that the people in my books who die typically deserve it. So... I, uh, I, I start from that for a premise, you know, I'm trying to not make them too dark um, uh, and uh, just trying to come up with sort of a humorous premise. Now, my, my biggest mystery series is my body mover series that I set in Atlanta, and uh, mm -hmm. it's the tone that I'm most concerned about. So they don't have to be like laugh out loud funny, but they're just lighter mysteries. And uh, the character in that book, she works for Neiman Marcus by day. And at night, she helps her younger brother move bodies from crime scenes. And that's how she gets sort of pulled into the mysteries. So just from the log line of that, you can see that it's a, you know, it's not, this is not going to be a police procedural. You know, this right. is someone who's, you know, she thinks she's a, a sleuth. She thinks she's, she, you know, she should be doing what she's doing. And because she's a fish out of water and kind of bumbling her way through it, it you know, that's what, that's where the humor comes from. Okay. 
Um, so are you on Goodreads? Um, so I have a presence on Goodreads. I have to say, if there's a hole in my career, it's probably where Goodreads is concerned. Um, just uh, it's just not something I've, I've focused on. But I thought mm -hmm. about at different times, my uh, virtual assistant will go out and set up contests for me. It used to be that it was mm -hmm. a, if you had a, a print book, that was a really good way to get the word out about the print book is to have a, a giveaway on Goodreads. Mm -hmm. I think that's still the case. Um, mm -hmm. I, but I'm, I'm going to defer here because I will say I'm not uh, I'm not the best person to ask about Goodreads, which does not say that you I mean you should be on Goodreads. It does not don't take your cues from me. I probably should be making more of it than I am. Well, I think everybody has to. To your point, you know you have to do what works for you, and it's not going to be the same recipe for everyone. Well, and you have to decide. There's so many outlets and mm -hmm. so many places that you can go to market and to reach readers that if you do you know, try everything, you spread yourself too thin. So what I've tried mm -hmm. is just focusing on a narrow few places and trying to make the most of those. So do you have a set amount of goals that you, or a set amount of books that you want to publish each year? Do you have that goal set or are you? Mm, okay, so in the beginning when I first started self-publishing, I had one goal and that was to self-publish as many books uh, under my own imprint as I had for traditional publishing. So at that point, I had written 60 books for traditional publishers. And so that's sort of my goal is to get to 60 at least for myself, um, just so that I've got, um, you know, I've got as many books out there working for me with my imprint on them as, as what is out there with traditional publishers' names on them. Um, so that's, there's that, there's that overall goal that I haven't reached yet. Mm -hmm. um, but then other than that, I, um, I do a, a six part serial every year. I start in July and I uh, run a daily serial on my website from July 1st through December 31st. Readers can go there and get the entire story for free. If they go every day, they get that day's episode. But I also publish mm -hmm. those in novellas. So I have monthly novellas. So a July novella, August novella. And uh, so I know going into the year that that's going to dominate my six, last six months of the year and that I will have those six releases no matter what. And then when the, the serial is written, then I put it out in print and in audio. So I know those are, are certain releases that I have. Also, I have a series, the Body Mover series I mentioned. I have a, a release a book in it every spring. Uh, so I, mm -hmm. I space those out, you know, one every year. And uh, so I know that's going to be on my list. And then lately, as I've been getting rights reverted from my publisher and getting you know, the rights back to books little by little, those books are so old that I've been having to go back and practically rewrite them to get them ready to put out. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I've been putting those out. So they're not necessarily new books, but um, they're taking as much time as if I were writing a new book. Uh, so I, okay. I try to... I would say maybe four or five books a year um, is okay. minimum for me, but mm -hmm. more lately, more like eight. Gotcha. So let's go back to the the serial um, posting one a day and then mm -hmm. um, posting the uh, the novella. It's a really mm -hmm. interesting concept. That um, do you, do the people that read those do they have to sign up for your newsletter in order to get yep. access to that? Okay, no, you don't, I do, don't that. do that. I might, I, you know, maybe in the future, I might put that behind a, I won't say a paywall, but, you know, basically to make someone, uh, you know, to give them, get your email address before you can access this. I might do right. that at some point. Um, but at this point, I think it's just, you know, I just leave it open to everyone. So mm -hmm. the way that works is it accumulates on my website for 10 days, the first 10 mm -hmm. days of July. And that allows a lot of readers to kind of get in on it, invite their other friends to get in on it. And then on July 11th, it reverts to just one episode a day. So if they come to my website every day, they can get the entire story for free. But if they want to catch up or if they want to read ahead, um, then they can buy the novellas. And what I found is a lot of my readers would just do a mix and match. So they mm -hmm. might read uh, July for free, for free, but then they know that August is going to be busy. So they buy the August novella um, or they might read the whole thing for free and then buy the print book at the end. Um, mm -hmm. or just, you know, anyway, it just gives me lots of different ways to offer the story for 
for consumption and for sale and readers seem to like it yeah i would think that that's a i think that's a great idea and one i hadn't heard of before so i think that's really um innovative um let's see now you mentioned um there's a couple of things I want to go back to. One of the things mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, when we were talking about your covers uh, had to do with the fact that you like it because it doesn't assign, you know, race or age or whatever to, you know, there's no preconceived notions, which I think you're right. right you do see with other covers. Um, mm -hmm. How do you manage that within the, the work itself? Do you not give a description of the characters or what kind of descriptions do you give of the characters? Yeah, I try to keep the descriptions as generic as possible. Um, I, I typically will allude to their age just because I feel like that does have um, a lot to do with how the character behaves and not necessarily in the best ways. So, you know, my, my right. 30 year old uh, Carlotta Wren character in Body Movers, I mean, she's 30 and she's a, she's mm -hmm. um, mature in some ways, but she's immature in some ways. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she's not going to behave the way that a, you know, a 50 year old woman would behave. Um, right. So I think it's important that you, you do put some parameters and description around your characters. Um, so your um, your readers know, you know, they can they can draw some conclusions. Uh, mm -hmm. But I just try to be, um, I don't say generic, I don't know if that may be the best word, but I just like to leave readers, you know, to use their imagination. Mm -hmm. I think that's what sometimes when readers see um, books that are made into movies or TV shows mm -hmm. and it doesn't match the description that was put in the books, you know, it just upsets people. Uh, so, right. yeah, I like for people to think of their own, you know, to have in mind uh, their own um, idea of what the character looks like really good call out so we've got time for one more question um, and with the introduction of COVID into our lives a lot has changed how much mm. has that impact your life and your you know your promotion um, of your books or your writing mm, so in good ways and bad ways I mean I think like everyone I'm as I'm concerned about what um, COVID is doing to our economy and um, how it affects most people's you know, jobs and, and their way of life and just their mental state, uh, not to mention their physical wellness. Um, so that's, I'm concerned as everyone else about those things. Um, I live alone, so I have a little bit of, um, you know, built in, um, you know, I'm kind of quarantined anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I just decided from the beginning, there's not a lot that I'm going to be able to do about this on the whole. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to try to come out of this, being able to look back and think I, you know, I got some things done that I wanted to do, look at it as a time when I'm, I have the time and maybe luxury, even if that's the right word, to do some things mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have done before because I'm not socializing mm -hmm. as much, I'm not getting out as much. so. I'm writing more. I've done more to sort of uh, just get a analyze my business and you know put into practice some things that don't always get done. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm as far as marketing goes, I'm just doing more of this, so more video, uh, more mm -hmm. online marketing, and just more engagement with my readers. Uh, which you know that's that's good because they're also looking for engagement. So this right. is a good time to reach out to readers because this is when they they want to be in get that's it's when they want to interact with you the most mm -hmm. excellent excellent point well we are at time but i want to thank you so much for joining us this mm -hmm. has been really enlightening this has been you've shared a lot of really great tips so appreciate well, that thanks i hope it's been helpful everyone out there just be well and take care and uh, thanks for joining us today Absolutely. And just a reminder to everyone uh, in the audience, we will be, we were recording this. So the recording will be up on our YouTube channel, fingers crossed, uh, later today. And you'll receive a follow up email uh, tomorrow with the link to our help pages that have the recording or 
on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, followed us on YouTube, and that way you'll get alerted once I upload this. And thank everybody so much. And as always, happy publishing. Bye, everyone.